People were changing that, and we, we moved the registry key, and then he said, ah, oh, here's where they moved it to. He said, ah, oh, here's where they moved it to. <laughs> <laughs> something, about, something about the words of a technical fellow. They resonate through time. <laughs> Anyway, so Mark and the, the Windows team had this cat and mouse going for a while before they finally said, please stop doing that. And he did. Anyway, so at this point, you know, we really just took a desktop, tipped it on its side, and the fact of the matter was it worked out incredibly successfully. But that really was a great operating system for a world where, like, here's my server, and I walk up to you. I got a server, I walk up to it and I give it a hug, I got a keyboard, I got a mouse, I got a screen, and, and it was a great operating system. And the fact that we didn't draw a distinction between <coughs> the desktop and the server served us incredibly well. Yay. Then at some point we saw the future. We said, yeah, that's great, but in a data center where it's more than, you know, boy and his dog, guy and his, his server, and it's a guy and lots of servers, uh, that that's not going to work. And so we started, started in 2008, to draw the separation between core and full server. Now the original implementation of core had challenges. Um, it was, you know, the manageability wasn't great. It did not have PowerShell. Um, we didn't have a lot of things on it. And honestly, we weren't that clear about whether we were serious about it or not. We didn't go whacking people around the head, you know, our partners saying you have things. So a bunch of partners required this. And by the way, you couldn't go back and forth, okay? So 2012 really was the coming of age of server core, where now everything was built on server core. You could go from server core all the way up to the desktop experience and back down again. We had PowerShell. We improved our manageability. And far more components were there. So this is sort of our journey. This is, this is just a, a wonderful world, okay? And that's great. However, However, this is the journey of the world's most successful enterprise operating system. But there's this thing called the cloud, okay? And whereas the world's, some of the world's largest services, cloud services, are run on Windows Server, Bing, Office 365, Azure, etc. It's just a statement of fact that kids coming out of college doing cloud startups are not choosing Windows Server as their default cloud operating system of choice. It's my job to fix that problem, okay? And we are gonna fix that problem. And Windows Server will be the world's most successful cloud operating system, just as it was the world's most successful enterprise operating system. Now, some people balk at that and say, no, that's impossible. I will tell you, quite honestly and quite forth, forthright, that, that the challenges I have to make it be a great cloud operating system are nothing compared to the challenges Microsoft had taking a desktop operating system and turning it into a server. The path before us is really quite simple. Uh, we have the problem in focus and we will execute and you'll see that I'm, I'm right. Now, one of the ways we'll do this, we'll make, put some money down, I'm ready. Okay, now, one of the things is that, uh, you know, what do we mean by the cloud, right? Well, if you go talk to people, you get lots of different versions. If you go talk to Amazon, they'll say, it's all about the public cloud, the public cloud. Let me tell you why the private cloud's terrible. It's a horrible thing. You can't, pop. you're a moron if you even think about doing anything with a private cloud. And then you go talk to VMware and they'll say, let me tell you why the private cloud is the most only thing you want to do. You'd be a moron if you thought about the public cloud. That's an idiot. You're idiots of security, blah, blah, blah. And our approach says, well, you know what? They're both wrong, but they're both right. There are some points. <clears throat> and so Microsoft's approach to the cloud is to offer the cloud to you on your terms. This is Azure, public cloud, private cloud, and this cloud platform solution. <clears throat> so basically, whether you want to run it in the public cloud, you want to run it on your hardware, your private cloud, or you want to run it on a trusted third party's cloud, a hoster cloud, we're going to support you. And there are differences between these. So you got to figure out what's right for you, but here's the deal. I don't care. <laughs> you know, you, whatever works for you, we're going to help you succeed. And that's one of the reasons why we're going to do so well, because we're focused in on helping the customer succeed, whereas the other guys are focused in on trying to make them succeed by sort of not telling you the whole truth. Anyway, so that's, that's one point. So, <clears throat> so, but here's the point. 
just as at some point we needed an, uh, you know, an operating system uh, uh, optimized for a server as opposed to a desktop, so too we need an operating system optimized for the cloud. Now, I mentioned to you that we run Azure, right? Azure is one of the largest consumers, purchasers of servers in the world, like literally. When Intel looks and tries to figure out whether they're gonna make any money next year, they look to see how many servers Azure is going to buy as like a key component of that. I mean, it's really at that level. So, I literally mean we need a cloud optimized a Windows Server optimized for the cloud. Pretty sure you need one as well, but I know we need one. So, let's talk about Microsoft Azure Stack. Microsoft Azure Stack. By the way, how many people have ever heard of that? <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Okay, both rooms. Okay, so the Microsoft Azure Stack is really, here's the way to think about it. Okay, so yes, it's Azure running on your hardware, okay? Um, uh, but basically what it is, is it executes the OS responsibilities for private cloud hardware configurations. And at the heart of this, PowerShell's at the heart of the cloud OS. Okay, so that's the big walk away, right? Our future is the cloud, the future is MAS, the cloud on premises is MAS, and at the heart of that is PowerShell. So I'm gonna kind of walk you through how that, what that translates to and where we're using PowerShell and PowerShell, you know, kind of centric technologies um, in our cloud OS. So first let's talk about this, right? So f realistically what we're talking about here is taking an operating system, instead of thinking about an operating system running in the context of a server, we're talking about an operating system running in the context of lots of servers, right? Instead of components connected with a, with a PCI bus and a North Bridge and a South Bridge, we're talking about components that are connected with Ethernet and topper rack switches and such. <laughs> okay, so we have to re-execute the context, right? So now, operating systems are, are very complex implementations, but at the heart, the mission of an operating system is really quite simple. So number one, it has to manage hardware and software resources for consumption by multiple users, right? So you gotta manage the life cycle of these things, you gotta find them, you gotta install them, start them, stop them, manage resources, etc. Next is it has to establish protection zones, right? I mean, that's what really user space and kernel space are. They're protection zones, right? User space, you know, hey, you can take the, you know, look, let's be clear. The world is a bell has a bell shape, right? You got the world's best developers and you got the world's worst developers. In user space, the answer is we can take any of that code and run it. Now, what is that, what's the user space oper job of the operating system? The job of the operating system says, hey, if you have the world's worst code running on a system, the system gets protected, by, protects itself, and protects the world's best code, right? So it manages things so that multiple people can consume common resources in a way that is coherent, right? Next is the kernel space has to protect itself. So, so no matter what, you know, you can always get the kernel up and running, it protects itself. So this is a notion of one, managing resources, two, establishing protection zones, and then three, supporting applications, right? Making it easy to run applications, <clears throat> making it easy to develop and run applications. So, you know, we've got DLLs, we've got services, all the stuff you see in Visual Studio, APIs, and then managing tools to manage the applications. So, so really what we're talking about here in MAS is taking these OS responsibilities and again, instead of executing them in the context of a single machine, execute them in the context of lots of machines. And you can, now you'll see how, I'll show you a big animal picture of MAS and then we'll kind of walk through this stack and show you how PowerShell plays a role. So at the bottom here, you have compute, you know, sorry, hardware you know, compute, storage, networking, other. These are disaggregated components, right? They're just, I got, I got a server. I might have one server, I might have four servers, I might have 400 servers, eventually even larger. Now, in order to succeed with that, you wanna have a data center abstraction layer, right? Things like plug and play, uh, and then a driver model, and then you've gotta take that raw hardware, 
configured in a particular format and do the initial system load, right? Get the operating system on there. Then you're going to have a, a <coughs> kernel, again, that protects itself, manages these resources, provides services. You're going to have a user space where we're going to have a portal. That'll be the Azure portal. We'll have a gallery of components and applications. Think of this like the Windows Store. By the way, that's, a, that's one of the themes you'll see is think about how things work today on a single machine and then think, well, how would they work in this environment? Okay, and then we have to build those. Now, it's not the same components at all, but the same roles still need to be done. I'll give you examples of that. And then, of course, you build applications on top of that. So let's start at the bottom layers here, hardware and this data center abstraction layer. Okay, so now think about, anybody ever have a, one of the early CD-ROMs? Yeah? yeah? With the bent paper clips? You know, I was, a, I was like one of the advanced developers at, at, at Digital, and I was one of the first guys to get a CD-ROM. And boy, was I so excited. I got a CD-ROM coming. I got a CD-ROM coming. I was just so thrilled. And then when I found out it arrived, it was on the loading dock, I like cleared my calendar. No, I can't attend that meeting. I'm gonna be loading my CD-ROM. I got a CD-ROM, I got a CD-ROM. <laughs> and then it showed up and it's like, okay, what? And there's bent paper clips and dip switches and tears and it took two days and I felt stupid and it was just horrible, horrible, horrible. Well, now that's not how it works, right? So uh, what was it? I guess a year or two ago, my, my boss uh, had said, oh, something happened and he got a DVD. And he looked at this thing, he's like, what do I do with that? Right, because he had an Ultrabook, right? There's no DVD slot on an Ultrabook. And he's like, huh, yeah, I never thought, I, I don't know what the heck I'm gonna do with this. So he went to a store, I joke, and I say it was a 7-Eleven, I don't know what it was, but he did not spend time researching what to do. He just went to a store, got a USB DVD reader off the shelf, he came, took it out of the plastic, plugged it in, put the DVD in, did what he needed to do, unplugged it, put it in the drawer, and hasn't looked at it since. Now think about that a second. Okay, this is very far distance from the world of the bent paper clip and the tears, right? So he plugged in a piece of hardware. The system has established a set of protocols to be able to detect new things onto the system, new hardware. It has protocols to be able to go and enumerate what is that thing, what are the capabilities, and has a way to find the associated software, bring it to bear, and then offer the services of that new device to the user with no drama whatsoever. Uses it, puts it, throws it away, okay? So, effectively, that's what we need to do. Now, anybody have a data center? Does that sound like your data center experience? <laughs> yeah, no. No, not so much. It will. It will. It will. It didn't, by the way, the first version of plug and play wasn't that way. The first version of plug and bay, play, Bill Gates got it in front of like 10,000 people, plugged it in, and went blue screen. <laughs> These are hard, hard, hard problems, and they take a long time to solve, and we will solve them. It, data center plug and play will be a reality. Watch, it's gonna be crazy. At some point you're gonna get one of these new devices, like a complex device, a Tor or a SAN or something, and you're gonna plug it in and it's just gonna work and you're like, I remember when. Well, in fact, we're getting pretty close there already. With, now this is what we already have, right? With storage, we adopted SMIS. SMIS is a storage standard, and literally it's modeled after plug and play, or we use it in a way that's modeled after plug and play. You take a SAN, you plug it into your data center, and here now you have to initiate a discovery cycle, but, and in doing so you have to provide credentials. That's a good thing. It's a, it's a little speed bump, but it's a good speed bump. But you provide credentials for that SAN, we will discover it, we will find all those resources, and we will make those resources available to you through a common set of APIs, PowerShell commandlets, local GUI tools, and system center tools that makes it completely, that allows you to manage this storage area network exactly the same way you manage local disks, local Windows manage, local Windows storage. So we're off to a pretty good start there. Anybody using that stuff? Hey, you should. It's crazy good. Anyway, so that's stuff that we've had, and now we're trying to do the same thing with networking. 
uh, we defined some DMTF networking schema. Now it turns out this is sort of like WMI stuff. Uh, on the Linux space, they didn't have good implementations of WMI. We know because we were using the open source one there as part of System Center, and it worked, but it was just a pig dog slow and uh, and we said well look if we're going to have a real commercial product of managed linux and windows together we need a good fast implementation of this so we rewrote our own we call it omi and we've open sourced it and quite literally you know cisco arista and others are taking microsoft's open source implementation of wmi and shipping it in their hardware like last year it's crazy. Anyway, and they do so to implement these schemas. And why do they do that? Because we also then shipped a set of network switch commandlets in Windows. And in fact, network switches ha can now get the Windows logo. You know, the Windows logo, like that DVD. You know, I don't know that he investigated it very much because they all are Windows logoed. But if you see a DVD that says Windows logo certified and one that doesn't, buy the one that does. Okay. So too. We have a set of criteria, because we have a set of criteria and tests that say, hey, if your DVD does this, it's got the logo. If it doesn't, you don't. Now there are network switches that can get the Windows logo certification, because we'll be able to do this. So that's sort of the backdrop. That's where we were. And now going forward, we're taking those switch commandlets. We had, again, pretty interim, you know, preliminary stuff. We're extending them so you do do much more management with those. We're adding desired state configuration for switches. So it's based upon the schema, but it's a little bit different. So I can send desired state configuration documents to switches. Okay. By the way, you see how this works? You might have remembered that we talked about desired state configuration being available for Linux. And like, oh, why, why, why would you do that? And the answer, here's one of the answers, because now you can do DSC for Linux. Okay, we are doing, um, working with the industry to do server and rack management via something called Redfish. So Redfish, these guys, there was IPMI, and there was Smash, and there was a bunch of other things, and they were not happy with those. They didn't feel like they were up to the task, they didn't like the implementation, and I think there were some even some licensing concerns. So a consortium of hardware vendors came up and said, we want to do uh, a REST API to do raw hardware management and chassis management for a rack. And they came to us and said, we'd like Microsoft to support it. And we looked at it, and it was a REST API. Now, do you know what a REST API stands for? It stands for what the designer was doing when he should have been doing engineering, okay? <laughs> it was just another random piece of stuff. And, and uh, there's some really good stuff to REST, but in general, it's an undisciplined area. It's really like a, a, a random DLL interface, like, whoa, oh, I support a DLL. It's like, what, the, what does that mean? And the answer is, well, it's whatever I happen to do. That's really what REST is, and so that's, okay for private conversations like you want to talk to yourself that's fine but in terms of like a, a, a community coming together and doing management that's not a good model and so what we did was we encouraged them to adopt OData now let's be clear about what OData is OData was a very strong SQL server based REST interface it has emerged to be a very general purpose mechanism uh, a set of conventions on REST interfaces. So at the heart, OData equals REST. OData equals REST. Plus, if you're talking about entities, here's how you should structure your URI to talk about the entity. If you're talking about a collection of entities, here's how you should refer to it. If you do filtering, here's how you should do filtering. If you do this, so it's a series of conventions, if then else, right? Um, and works out extremely well. And uh, so eventually they bought it. So in order to do this, for them to succeed, we had to enhance some of the OData stuff, right? It now supports JSON, originally it was XML, uh, so we support JSON. And one of the great things about OData, and one of the things that the hardware guys, like they hear the story and they're like, yeah, no. And like, the, here was the reality apparently. The reality was, yeah, I already got an implementation in my pocket. I'm not telling anybody about that because I was just talking about, hey, maybe we should do this. And then when you agree, I'm going to come out with my implementation and be a year ahead of everybody. Cool. Uh, <laughs> so when we're like, yeah, why don't we change it so we do this? They're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> they didn't want to change that. Um, and what turned the tide, and they were very vigorous about this, but what turned the tide was we said, well, hey, listen, we'll do a mock-up. 
We'll do a mock-up and we'll show you what happens when you can do this. If you have an OData endpoint, then I can take PowerShell and I can point at that OData and I can auto-generate the commandlets. And like, really? Yeah. And I said, now, here's what that means. That means you implement this REST API, every single Windows customer in the world will be able to manage it. They're like, okay. And I said, now, the other thing is, they can manage it from their Windows box and you didn't put any code on that box. I generate the commandlets. You don't generate the commandlets. So what that means is when I have another version of Windows Server, you don't have to stop new development to go test to see if your commandlets still work. That's my responsibility. I'm like, okay. And I said, now, the other thing is you're producing Redfish and you're producing Redfish and you, you want the stuff to work with both your implementations, right? And they're like, yeah. I said, but you're going to do extensions, aren't you? Well, yeah, we're all going to do extensions. Well, how are people going to take advantage of that? Like, well, we're going to do this, this, and this. I said, well, wait, no, stop. If you do OData, then you do those extensions. We will ship with the commandlets in box to manage everything at a common layer, but we're also shipping this tool. So the customer will be able to get your box, buy your box, point at it, and auto-generate the commandlets to get all of your proprietary stuff. They heard that, and they're like, that's exactly what we want. And so they switched. And so they switched. Now again, one of the great things here, and this is going to be a watch this space, was what the, originally what they had done with the REST APIs was it was very much a you know itch scratch. I got an itch, I scratch it. Okay, I have a thing, I, I got to do a problem, I got an API. I got to do a problem, I got an API. The thing about OData is a separation. It's a management protocol. There's a separation between the protocol and the schema, which means I can use the same protocol and just to manage new things as new schema gets generated, okay? So this, right, is gonna, this generic tool is pointed at this endpoint and it's gener gonna generate uh, rack and server management utilities. At some point they're gonna say, hey, we'd like to manage something else and we will be able to point the same tool at, and all they have to do is define the schema for that something else and all the tools in the whole ecosystem and value proposition plays. Okay, so the point I'm making was that PowerShell and the ability to take advantage of, of uh, auto-generate PowerShell commandlets was the thing that really transformed the whole conversation from uh, us going down yet another random hardware management thing that may or may not work to something I'm really quite optimistic about. Okay, so we had to extend this to make it more successful. Uh, the latest, support the latest version of OData, support paging so you can support very large numbers of objects, server-side filtering, web, web, web request header support, and again, our intention is to ship the commandlets ourselves and then allow the, and then also ship the tools so that as people add proprietary value added extensions, customers can generate their own. Now let's talk about this initial system load. Now, MAS is not uh, our first uh, effort in the space. Last year with Windows Server 2012, R2, I guess, we released something called CPS. CPS is a combined hardware-software platform, one to four racks um, of servers, and that was entirely set up using a PowerShell script. The whole thing was set up using a PowerShell script which is great, except, boy, there were some opportunities to improve. So now what we're doing is we're using desired state configuration. At the time, desired state config was not at a level where it could solve this task. Now it is. And in fact, what we did was we took Rob Willis, who wrote the PowerShell Deployment Toolkit, and I uh, uh, basically uh, recruited him to do this setup, you know, to basically redo the PowerShell Deployment Toolkit using desired state configuration to give us a real, you know, close signal like, hey, tell me when we're full of, you know, nonsense. Tell me where it doesn't work. Tell me where we don't scale. Don't do workarounds. Tell us about the problems. And then two, prioritize the, the resource uh, development. So if you go take a look at the, the DSC resource gallery, you'll be able to connect the dots between what's there and what's needed for here. The other dot you won't be able to connect is, boy, this stuff seems to be in pretty reasonable shape. And why? Because I have a, a strong, vital need that it work, right? The cloud is the most critical thing we're doing. Microsoft Azure Stack, running the cloud, running Azure on-premise, one of the most critical things we're doing. This stuff 
has to work or critical missions will not work. So, you think we're going to invest to make DSC work? We're going to invest to make DSC work. Work really well. So, some of the things that Rob found was the need for multi-machine synchronization. Okay, the ability to say, you know how that depends on? Well, well, think about it. Okay, <laughs> this, this fabric here has lots of components, right? So, before I set up System Center, I need to set up SQL. Before I set up SQL, I need to set up AD. I'm not running all those all on the same box. So I have this DSC that's going to be deployed, and all of a sudden somebody comes up and says, hey, I want to run System Center. Is SQL on that machine running? No? You better wait. Hey, SQL, are you, are you ready to go? Well, I don't know. Is AD ready to go? No. Okay, well, wait. Hey, AD, you ready to go? Let's go. Install AD. Hey, is that AD ready? Yep. Okay, great. Install SQL. Hey, is that SQL ready? Yep. Go, great. Go install System Center. And so that's how it works. So great, great feedback there. Turns out that as you install some of these things, they require different credentials. So we added this ubiquitous PSDSE run as credentials, which says any, any particular resource can say, I need this credential. This is at the infrastructure level that says, hey, I don't care whether he supports credentials or not. The system supports credentials, and we'll go and say, when you go execute this resource, do so under this context. And of course, DSC manageability, diagnostics, and reporting. We're going to invest heavily in this stuff. Again, not because you need it. Of course you need it. And we do it anyway, but I'm telling you, we need it. You know, Such has this great statement. He said, uh, he said, you know, I don't know what it is. It's as though it's magic. There's this magical device that I can, I can use to make software better. I just take this thing called a pager and I put it on a developer's belt and all of a sudden the software gets better. <laughs> it's just magic. Uh, and so too, it really is just this world of difference between, by the way, so get that in focus, right? So here's the, here's the test. Has anyone ever seen something called a general error occurred? Yep. Generally here. Okay, so what that means is that developer clearly was not thinking about the customer's experience, right? It was five o'clock, he ran into a problem and he thought, well, I'll just type a general error occurred, I'll go home and have dinner with, nice dinner with the wife, right? Now, now, he also did that because at the end of the day, he was gonna produce a CD-ROM, that CD-ROM was gonna go through some channel years from now, at some point years after that, somebody get that CD-ROM, they'd install it, he probably is not gonna encounter that problem, and if he does, they're going to call CSS. This guy's never going to have heard about it. He'll have gone off to another job, or even if he's still at the same job, CSS has a way of managing that stuff. Life is good for that guy. That's not this world, baby. When we're running Azure, and he writes a crappy error message, and it's 2 o'clock in the morning, the pager goes off. Honey, get the goddamn phone. What are you, why, why, what the heck's going on? I'll get it, honey, I'll get it. What? A general, what? Oh, I shouldn't have written that. <laughs> That's not helpful. And, and so this feedback loop of Microsoft really running things, really having skin in the game is going to improve everything. I'm, it is the number one thing I'm most optimistic about the company. Now these things take a while, et cetera, right? You know, uh, you're running, you, you wrote that code last year and now you're running stuff and now the code going forward is going to get better or you didn't get the call, you get the call, so you write good code. He didn't get the call, so he's still writing crap code. This stuff takes a while to flesh itself out, but it's very, very clear that it's going to. And so that's why this stuff, you know, look, you might need it. I know I need it. Okay. Oh, what happened there? Okay, so now collapse. Uh, we also now drive the DSC resources, right? Um, and again, what we're doing is we're doing that through open source, right? So we're open sourcing the DSC resources. We're doing it on GitHub. This allows us to move faster and get better quality. We needed to improve the resource creation, right? Of these MOFs and these, and I changed the MOF, and then I got to change the scripts, and I changed two of them, and I forgot that. And like, no, 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 no. So classes. Uh, and the ability to debug stuff just dramatically increases the ability to create most resources. And then, of course, the ability to find, install, and manage your DSC resources. These are all critical things for this initial system load. 
And then lastly, we had to improve the DSC authoring experience. Okay. Um, actually, one thing, uh, where are we going to get to? I think we're going to talk about this a little bit later. Yeah, we'll talk about it later. Anyway, so we need to improve the authoring experience. So listing the DSC resources, IntelliSense, tab completion uh, for the resource values and depends on. So there's quite a bit of work that we've done because this initial system load of MAS needs it. Okay. Now let's talk about this, this kernel space. Now again, there are, uh, on CPS, I think there's, I don't remember how many, but over 30, upwards of 40 different VMs necessary to run the <coughs> private cloud, right? So we've got Active Directory, we've got Backup. By the way, so you get big eyes, like really? Yeah, I'm telling you, setting up a private cloud is a complex business. The number of moving parts, incredible. It's one of the reasons why a lot of people go out there uh, and have you know stubbed their toes on private cloud deployments. You know, you hear a lot about OpenStack, OpenStack, OpenStack. See anybody doing real OpenStack? Oh yeah, we got to we're evaluating it. Yeah, you're evaluating it. Here's what that means: private clouds really, really hard to do. So that's one of the key values of CPS is we've done that systems integration for you. By the way, the folks who have, by and large, if you took a look at the folks that have have failed with private cloud solutions against the ones who have succeeded with private cloud solutions. The ones who have succeeded, how do they succeed? And there's two camps. One is the folks who wrote, who are just excellent at the task of systems integration, like they hire people like you, because you're great systems integrators, or they hire great systems integrators, right? They just write really big checks to systems integration firms. Anyway, so that's part of the value of CPS is we do all that systems integration for you, okay? So it's really hard stuff. Now, so this MAS kernel space here, uh, key thing we're doing here, in order to succeed at the cloud, we gotta have nano server, right? Nano server is the basis of our cloud going forward. And why is that? Nano server, and you know, I, I like to joke about server core. Server core is about half the size of full server, but it's more than twice a pain in the ass. Okay, <laughs> nano server is 20 times smaller, 20 times smaller than full server. <clears throat> it is, um, you know, has much li lower resource consumption, much higher security, and much lower serviceability footprint. So that's why this is the basis of things. Now, the part of nano server is that it doesn't have all the big components, right? It does not have the desktop CLR does not have the desktop CLR. It has the core CLR, or .NET Core. And so PowerShell, of course, runs on the desktop CLR. So to run on Nano Server, we have to have a new version of PowerShell. We call this Core PowerShell. Lots of work there. Now, with Nano Server, um, there's a great story about Cortez the Explorer. Cortez, um, you know, takes his men, has his journey, finally gets to the to the new, uh, new country, and um, as a matter of like, boy, that sucks. I don't like this place. That was a, that was a let's just go home. I'm like, no, no, we're staying. I'm like, no, we think we're gonna go home. So what does Cortez, he's got a problem, what do he do? And the answer is he burned his ships. Burned his ships, and they're like, oh, I guess we can't go home. No, we're gonna make it work here. Well, nano server in some ways is that burning of the ships, right? With, with server core, you had the uh, ability to do uh, remote desktop. There were all sorts of ways you could get around doing great remoting, right? With nano server, there isn't. If you can't remote it, you can't manage it. And that's forcing us to go do a fantastic job of remote management in lots of different ways. The three that I think are most clear are now in PowerShell, you can do remote editing, remote debugging, and remote file transfer over PSRP, okay? Now, we've thought about those things for a while, but it's really nano server that said, no, those, those are not things we should eventually get to. We need to do those things now, and there'll be plenty more like that. Now, this, now I wanna stop here and highlight one really important dynamic. I know that when Microsoft and I talk about cloud, 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 a whole bunch of you are like, blah, blah, blah. I'm, I don't care about the cloud. I'm not going to the cloud. Cloud, 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 shut, the, you know, shut up about the cloud. I'm an enterprise guy and I just wanna be a good enterprise guy. I wanna hear what you're doing for the enterprise. Here's the thing you need to understand. 
the vast majority of the things we're investing in to do a great job in the cloud apply equally to the enterprise. Not 100%, not 100% at all, but the vast majority of them do. In the context of the cloud, these are absolutely critical. And it turns out, having invested in these, all you guys who are in the enterprise are gonna love this stuff. DSC, absolutely critical in the cloud, and for the enterprise scenarios, it's gonna help you as well. Okay, so just wanted to like, this, this is one I think really makes that point. You're, you know, you have nothing to do with the cloud. You're gonna love remote file editing, remote transfer. Security. Uh, we have to make this, this is our secure layer, so we've got to be do a great job here. By the way, I'll distribute this, this deck. All these things are links to blogs and such for additional information. Lee Holmes did a fantastic job describing all the stuff that we've done in this release for security, and, and it is vast. So we had a session on that uh, where we talked about this, the enhanced security logging. Enhanced security logging, basically, um, uh, the bad guys, I don't know if you know this, bad guys love PowerShell. Why do they love PowerShell? And the answer is, they have exquisite taste in tools. <laughs> they are really quite clever fellows, even though they're evil in their heart, they're, they're quite clever. Uh, no, it's actually true. They are just, they're just, they use tools, right? You use tools for good. Well, somebody said, the, the, the line between a good clown and a bad clown is very fine. The line between systems administration and hacking is a very fine line. Now, so that's one reason is that they can do incredibly powerful things uh, with a very small amount of code. So I'm quite serious about that. But there was another reason. And the other reason was that whereas we have the ability to log almost everything, <coughs> that almost part uh, gave them an opportunity to do something and not be detected. And this enhanced security logging now closes that down. Okay, so now we can detect everything that people do. We now have protected. Once those bad guys get on a machine, and you'll see, there will be a, you will see a big shift in the way we talk about security. We no longer talk about, you know, if this machine gets cracked, da 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 da. We talk about when. We assume that systems are going to be cracked. Now, we will continue to invest to make sure that they aren't, but we're going to assume that they are, and we're going to put a plan in place for when they are. When a server gets cracked, one of the techniques they do is to try and mine that server for information to get to the next one and the next one and the next one. So just as a submarine is built, assuming that it's going to take on damage, when it takes on damage, they're able to compartmentalize that and keep the ship afloat. I guess, I don't know if the submarine is afloat or not, but anyway, <laughs> not, not have everyone die is through engineered compartmentalization. So too, throughout all of our software, we will be building these intentional components because when a system gets cracked, look, we got nation states after us, nation states with unlimited budgets. Your systems will get cracked. What we can do is we can compartmentalize it. So one of the things the bad guys do is they look for other information to go other places. One of the richest sources of information is the event log. So this protected event logging encrypts the logs. Right? You get a public key, you use that public key to encrypt the log, you then forward the logs to another machine where you use a private key to unencrypt them. So then when they, when they crack this machine, they don't get anything out of the logs. They can't read the logs. Uh, now we did that using a set of techniques that then we made available to everyone. So you can use our crypto command list to encrypt and decrypt anything you want in addition to the logs. We now have ubiquitous transcripts. So we got good logging now. Now, great logging is great for things like uh, big data analytics, looking for intruders. And so what you look for is people doing things differently than they should, than a normal user would. And you say, that's something suspicious, and you want to follow up on it. Well, how do you follow up? <coughs> well, all the information's in the logs, but it turns out that logs are not a particularly good way to really understand what somebody did, you know? And so what we now have is transcripts and the idea of ubiquitous transcripts. Ubiquitous transcripts provides this over-the-shoulder view of what someone's typed and what the output was. And that's then stored and you can forward it, you, know, you can store it in a, in a, on a network file share so that you can then use the uh, event log to look for the odd thing, use that to then use it as an index into these logs and then see exactly what had happened, what they were doing, what they were after. 
So great stuff. We've integrated in with the Windows 10 anti-malware. We've got code generation APIs to be able to generate code in a secure way. And we're adding just enough admin, which we talked about in the past. So we've, in addition to nano server, we've done a lot of work in security. And then developers. So when we did this project, um, was when we did the CPS project, we had a bunch of developers doing the installation. I mentioned it was all done with PowerShell scripts. And at some point, the development manager talked to me and he said, yeah, um, you know, people hate PowerShell. I said, oh, okay, tell me more about that. He says, yeah, my developers hate PowerShell. They don't want to use PowerShell. And I said, okay, well, why? And they then said, well, you know, it's not, you know, here are the problems. And we listened to those things. And we had long said, you know, we wanted a tool that spanned the range of operators to developers. And in some regard, we did that. But in, if we were just being honest, I'd say we've largely focused in on operators and a little less so on developers. So when we listened and drilled in, we saw, oh, you know, here's what the things that developers don't like about PowerShell. And then we fixed them. So number one is <coughs> Visual Studio is the developer tool of choice. And so ISE is great, but they're like, I'm a developer. This is the tool. I don't want to learn a new tool. I want to use uh, I, uh, Visual Studio. So we now have Visual <coughs> Studio support for PowerShell. Next is they say, look, my job's on the line here. And like with, with C Sharp code and C++ code, when I write my code, uh, I have tools to tell me whether I did a good job. In fact, I had a, the, the, the head of the development effort came to me and he's like beating me up and he says, look, so, you know, my schedule just slipped because some idiot checked in some code and they wrote bad code. And why aren't there static tools so that they can't check in this code without it working? Because if they did that, I wouldn't have had the, the hit in my schedule. It's like, you know, getting a punch in the face like that is a, is a, is a, uh, a, a awakening experience. And you know what, you're, you're right. No, he's right, he's valid. He should have punched me in the face. You know, we talked about that stuff, but it wasn't rising to the top. Rose to the top, script analyzer. Next, they say, hey, we're developers. You know, our career's on the line here. If we get this stuff wrong, you know, it's not just like, eh, try again. It's like, hey, review, uh, you, not so much. You get all the money this year. So I wanna be able to know that my code works. And I'm never really sure where I stand with PowerShell. So we added Pester, the ability for these guys to write unit tests, because that's the way they think. They get in Visual Studio, they write code, they want to run it against tests that tell them, hey, hey, buddy, good code. And then you can say, well, I had problems. And you can say, well, yeah, but the tool says I got at least those things right. So it engineers some confidence, and Pester engineers confidence more. Additionally, now support for classes, right? Uh, developers understand classes, but more importantly, more importantly, classes have a language mode, which is what developers are looking for. How many of you have ever written a function? I'll just say that this was a mistake, right? We had a mistake. How many of you ever written a function like this, right? Function, foo, and you write some blah, 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 and then you say return <laughs> x. Yeah? And like, yeah, functions rock in. I'm about that guy. <laughs> and then, and then, and then, you do something, and something that's the equivalent of right output. Y. Like right this? And all of a sudden, you've done a return, and Y and X are both showing up in the output stream. Your head explodes. It's complete insanity. <laughs> so so the, the answer was, in our effort to do a good job and make developers friendlier, you know, be friendly to uh, developers, we added this. It really was a mistake. It was a misstep because we also supported this and it just blows your head up. So in classes, there's a language mode that says, hey, if you're going to do a return, you have to declare that you're going to do a return. You know, well, it's different syntax. But basically, you have to declare the type. And then when you do this return, do as many of these as you want. I'm throwing them all away. The only thing that's going to get returned is here. And people say, yeah. 
So there's much stronger typing within classes, or there can be much stronger typing, and, and that's good. Anyway, so, um, so the net here is that now <coughs> we're making much more investment, many more investments to make sure that, power, that users, developers love PowerShell and that they can succeed with PowerShell, and that's going quite well. Okay, so in this area of the mass kernel, Investments in nano server, investments in security, investors, investments in doing a great developer thing. And again, these are things that then benefit everyone. I think lastly now we're on the top here, the, at, you know, the user space and the applications. Okay? So in order to be successful in, in the cloud, you really need to support this DevOps mindset, right? the DevOps workflow. So of course, mm -hmm. part of that is we got to get it ourselves. It's not, we can't stand there saying, hey, I'm going to develop software in the old water flow way, and uh, these set of tools are going to help you be this agile DevOps. I, I really have no idea what the hell I'm talking about, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be great. Good luck. No, that doesn't work. We've got to, we've got to get, we've got to walk the walk. We've got to be agile ourselves so we understand the pain, understand the issues, etc. Now I think we're doing that. We have very rapid cycles, and you've seen some of the pain, right? We, haven't, we didn't get that immediately right. You could argue we haven't quite got it right, but we're improving. We're <coughs> releasing things very, very quickly, and we're understanding where all of a sudden things are important and not. You know, what, what are the important things to do and not to support this? So rapid community-driven enhancements, um, sorry, uh, iterations. The DSC is the, is the center of our DevOps ex, um, strategy. And then testing, okay? One of the key things about going fast is the ability to be able to test so that you can make changes and know whether you've broken things, right? One of the models we have is, hey, we should get to a world where you make a change, make any change you want. Make a big change, a large, medium change, a large change. You run the tests, if the tests succeed, go. If the tests don't succeed, don't go. If you ran the test, they succeeded, and you pushed it, and something bad happened, what that meant was you didn't have the right tests. Go write some more tests. And with that mindset, you can go fast, 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 fast. And part of the key here is we're switching from a world of, of trying to ensure nothing ever goes wrong to a world where things will go wrong. We have the capacity and the speed to not go wrong for very long. I once had a friend who was quite athletic and someone said, wow, you just have fantastic balance. And he said, what are you talking about? I'm a klutz, I, I, I trip all the time. He says, but I'm really good at recovery. <laughs> well, that's what you wanna do, right? You wanna be really good at recovery. And of course, script analyzer, uh, package management. You want a world where you can find what you want and uh, immediately get it. Ultimately, where you're gonna see this go is that you know my vision for server is that server in the end ha can do exactly one function, exactly one function, and that is load optional software, right? Everything else should be put in a repository and kept live and kept up to date and kept servicing. Anybody ever install an operating system and then spend the next few hours like updating it with, <laughs> what the hell's that? What's with that? Why not have the thing that ships be, you know, get optional software? And by the time you get to it and you say, hey, now on Friday I want to install IIS, you're pulling it from a repository that's fully patched. Right? That's the way the world ought to be. We're not there, but that's where that's, that you can see where we're going. Okay, now in addition to that, right, this DevOps workflow uh, is management tools. Okay, now here of course we have the Azure commandlets and those are going to be available both against Azure on the private cloud as well, sorry, the public cloud as well as the private cloud and the hoster cloud. Those are all going to work. Additionally, there's DevOps tool support. Okay, now DSC is a desired state <coughs> configuration platform. Yes, there's a scripting environment to it and with the scripting environment you can have a do-it-yourself, do do-it-yourself, do you, 
I always get that wrong. I got a little bit of dyslexia. So some, I think it's correctly said, do it yourself. DIY. Sometimes I do a DYI, and so I joke. I say that's do yourself in. Anyway, so you can do either one of those things and build your own tooling, or you can go and buy one of these great tools out there that already exists, right? I've missed one. I've missed release management. But now Chef, Puppet, Guardrail, Aditi, uh, release management, these are all tools that you can buy. These are all DevOps tools that you can buy uh, and manage because they all support DSC. And we obviously have our operations management suite. This is desired state, this is, sorry, this is, um, think of it as like system center type products being run from the cloud. So you don't have to do the work of installing it, run it yourself. And of course we have Azure Automation, which is Windows PowerShell workflows running from the cloud, and they just recently added desired state configuration support. We have a couple guys from the team here. Um, they're going to think they're going to talk tomorrow. You definitely want to attend that. Great stuff. And again, all this stuff is PowerShell based. And lastly, we have the Azure DSC extension. So I don't know if you've seen this, but when you install, when you create a VM in this world, you can go and say, hey, I want a VM. And here's the DSC config I want for that VM. And you'll go and make it so. So that when the VM comes, when it's there, you get it as you want it, not, oh, it's a base VM and now I gotta do this and I gotta do this and I gotta do this. It'll come exactly the way you want it. And part of this is this DSC partial configuration, which is the idea that says, you might set up the VMs uh, and so you can configure the networking and the base infrastructure, and then someone else can configure the application space and how that all works together. So ultimately, then there's also now in this space, we want to be able to support both Linux and Windows. So we want to be really clear on this, right? I'm lead architect for Windows Server, but we want our cloud to be the best cloud whether you decide to use Windows or Linux. I got a lot of people invested to make Linux great on Windows and on our cloud. We will be the best cloud operating system, even for people who want to be pure Linux. Typically, it's a mixture. So that's one of the reasons why we invested in DSC for Linux and open sourced it. Right? So by the way, so what does it mean to be great for Linux? There are two answers. One is that a Linux application runs on this environment and gets the best performance, the best cost, etc. That's one thing. The next is that I can manage all of my stuff using a single common stack. That I don't have to say, well, if it's this, then I have, have to do that. If it's this, I have to do that. There's a single way to manage everything. So you'll be able to have desired state configuration for all your stuff, whether it's Windows or Linux. Next, OpenSSH for Windows. OpenSSH for Windows basically says, if you're a Linux customer and you want to run things on Windows, you can connect to your Windows box from your Linux box without having to add any software. You've got SSH on your box, you'll be able to remotely connect to Windows and manage it via SSH. WMI V5, WMF V5, making that available down level, so it's available whether you're on the latest, ver you have access to these functions, whether you're on the latest version of Windows Server or a previous version of Windows Server, and of course, Nano Server. Now, as we have this environment where we've got a single set of tools for managing different things. You know, PowerShell does its best work when it deals with structured data, and when it doesn't deal with structured data, you have regex. Anybody like ever figured out regex? Yeah, a bunch of people. I think it's like a. I think it's like a one guy. Okay, that's good. Dave Wyatt. So, if there are any questions about regex. Dave Wyatt has volunteered <laughs> to write them for you and test them. Uh, I think that's what I heard him say when he stuck his head in the room. Okay, so now what we have is, uh, by the way, I'm, I never got regexes. I mean, I can struggle through it and get it done, but it just sort of never really clicked for me. Convert from string is this rocket science uh, technology that we adopted from our research group uh, to be able to help with this problem. It basically takes a set of examples and then infers a parser from the examples. It works crazy well. So again, what this means is in this environment, we want to be able to minimize the cost to make all this stuff work. Whether you're dealing with structured data, 
Windows, we got a lot of structured data because we're an API oriented operating system. But as more and more things you deal with in the application space or me dealing with Linux routers or Linux components down here, we need to be able to manage those things as well where they don't have structured data. And so this is another great tool to be able to deal with that. So in the MAS space, lots of stuff, right? The, the user space. So all in all, what I wanted to point out here is that each one of these layers, right, the data center abstraction layer, the initial system load, the kernel, and the application space, each one of these things has fundamental dependencies. And in large degree, I don't think, I think it's fair to say, honestly, we could not succeed without, in these areas, without PowerShell technologies and the value propositions that are lit up because of PowerShell. So MAS. Right? Delivers Azure on your hardware. It executes these OS responsibilities in the context of a private cloud hardware, but it's private cloud or a hosted cloud. And really, at the heart of it is PowerShell. PowerShell is at the heart of our OS. So you have made a wise choice to come here. You've made a wise choice to learn PowerShell. Uh, you've made a wise choice to uh, communicate and be part of the PowerShell community because it is an investment which has paid off, has delivered incredible value to the company, and it's a reason why a guy like me got to be technical fellow. So occasionally I'll go still do these talks and I'll hear people ask the question, you know, should I learn PowerShell? And uh, this is, is my reaction to that. <laughs> you know, this is the, the quadruple face plant. And just like, now Don, Don has just completely given up with these people. Like just, he's not even gonna suffer any fools whatsoever. <laughs> he just won't even talk to them anymore. Um, yeah, so uh, last year I gave a talk and I made a set of predictions. I predicted we would have faster cycles, development cycles, that we would have even better community engagement, that we would be focusing in on developer and DevOps. Any of this sound familiar? <laughs> okay, uh, again, our base assumption here is really quite clear. Right? Um, it starts with the belief that we have finally gotten good as an industry, as a collective industry, we've finally gotten good at applying computing to solving business problems, right? No longer is IT just a cost that we're trying to reduce every year. Now all of a sudden we figured out how, hey, the more I compute, the better business I can drive. And the better business I can drive, um, the more money I can make, and therefore it's an investment. And the problem with this has always been that, well, it's sort of always been true, but we weren't very good at it. Some people were, most of us weren't. In general, most of us are getting better at it. In the past, there was friction associated with consuming more computing. The friction used to be money. Computers were expensive. Now computers aren't expensive. Computers are really cheap. Virtual computers are even cheaper, and cloud computers are very inexpensive, right? You can surge these up and surge them down, and when you surge them down, you're not paying for them anymore. It's a pretty darn good deal. So we've gotten pretty good at that. But at the heart, you need to be, the fric there's still a lot of friction, and that friction is in management. Even though the server itself is relatively inexpensive, managing that thing, getting into the proper configuration, securing it, making it operate the way you want is a point of friction. So that's why we're investing in a single common <coughs> stack to eliminate that friction, right? So my mission, my mission is to minimize the effort and risk to be able to consume tons of computing. Because if I can do that, you can drive business value. That business value is gonna then produce business results, which is then gonna invest in more investment for you. And I will tell you, I've been doing these conferences in the last few, the number of people who've come up to me and told me their success stories. In, a, in Charlotte, North Carolina, I had a guy come up to me and say, I learned PowerShell and I started to do all this work. I got a $57,000 a year raise. I said, wait, a $57,000 a year? Like five, seven, three, zero? He says, yeah. So holy schmoly. This other guy said, well, you know, I learned PowerShell and uh, my company didn't appreciate me. I learned this, I'm doing great stuff, the company didn't appreciate me. So I put PowerShell on my resume, I put it out there, I got a job just like that. He says, I got a $30,000 increase in pay having moved jobs. I said, wow, that's fantastic. He says, no, 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 that's just the beginning. 
He says, 18 months later, I, I did it again, and I got another $30,000 raise. I said, wait a second, wait a second. You're telling me in a matter of three years, you got a $60,000 increase in pay because you learned PowerShell? He says, yeah, man, I love you. I said, yeah, <laughs> I said, yeah I, I think you owe me a beer or two. <laughs> now the point is, like, and by the way, these are just a couple examples. There were lots of these things where because people were able to use PowerShell, they were able to drive business changes and they're being rewarded because of it, right? What we're seeing is this big, the gap continues to grow between the people doing things and the results they can achieve doing things the traditional way. Click, 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 oops. And you people who are able to use automation and say, test, 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 yeah? Great, now apply it to lots of machines. Apply it to lots of machines, apply it to lots of machines at night, <laughs> apply it to lots of machines when things go wrong, and the productivity gains are huge. And my community, it's my favorite part of the job is to see you people succeed and get these huge raises. I just love it. Anyway, so that's what we're trying to do here. We believe in this technology will help drive business value and the people who adopt it and, you know, accelerate their careers. And last year I predicted that we would open source PowerShell. So those are my predictions from last year. You heard the talk. Uh, you can see how that played out. So now my predictions for this year. I predict we'll have faster cycles, we'll better engage the community, we'll focus on our developers and DevOps. <laughs> and uh, my prediction is that some like open source PowerShell. Now at some point you say, okay, what's that? And uh, there's really two answers. One is, uh, my job is, as an architect, is to not look at today, but rather to see out in the future and see what's important and then predict, right? I wrote the Monad Manifesto in 2002, and boy did I put up with a lot of crap to be able to bring it to fruition. But I knew what was important. So too, these things are the important things, and they're not gonna be delivered in a year, and they're not gonna be delivered in two years. These are the things we're gonna work on for going forward. Um, the list will change, but there's a lot to do in these things, uh, and so you'll see that. And so you know, there's not gonna be a whole lot of surprises. Anyway, and you'll see that we're gonna do this stuff and we will continue to do this. Let me tell you a great story. I met with Barry Crist. Barry Crist is the CEO of Chef. <clears throat> really smart guy. If you haven't seen his talks, you should go see his talks. He's, a, he's an articulate, actually he's not the best speaker, but his message is very <laughs> clear and precise and, uh, and, and just really quite compelling. And when we talked about uh, them taking on and taking a dependency on DSC, Barry told me, he says, you know, we've watched you from afar for quite some time, you and the company for a while. And what we've seen in PowerShell is a story of continuous investment. He says, you know, honestly, you know, we watch Microsoft and you see you get all enthusiastic about something and then you move on and then you move on and you pick something up and you get enthusiastic and then you move on. He says, but that's not been the case with PowerShell. It started and then it got better and I got better and I got better and it keeps getting better. It's a story of continuous investment and that's why I'm confident that I can bet my company on the DSC platform, and that's a safe bet to do. PowerShell is the story of continuous investment, and what you've seen with the mass story, why that's gonna continue to be the case, and why those investments will continue to get better, stronger, more production worthy. So I mentioned to you, Windows Server, the Cloud OS, the Data Center OS, I'm right, DOS 10, the Cloud OS is powered by PowerShell, uh, I think that's a, probably a pretty good explanation for why Microsoft decided to make me their latest technical fellow. So, thank you for your, for your time. Okay. Want to do some cues? Want to do some questions? Yeah, I just don't want to pick it up on here. Okay. Yeah, go right ahead. Yeah.